Barber. Um, I'm a photographer. I've been a photographer for all my life, some 40 years or so. Um, I was a photographer at the uh, several newspapers before joining the Philadelphia Inquirer in 1983. I was a staff photographer there for 32 years and then left there in 2014 to join uh, to uh, to uh, join the faculty at Swarthmore College. And I run the photo department there. Um, uh, what else? Um, yeah, just been doing this for a long time. Yeah, if you want to know more about me, you can go to my website. It's rontarverphotographs.com or .net rather, or Google my name and, and things will pop up there. My bio's there. Um, so anyway, I'll just get started about the uh, this project that I've been working on since almost since the time I started at the Inquirer. Um, I started this project, Black Cowboys, in 1983. Um, and how this came to be was I had worked on a long-term project, uh, and I'm supposed most of you remember the Inquirer Sunday Magazine. Um, I did a project for them on uh, on uh, drugs in North Philadelphia, a long-term project on drugs in North Philadelphia. And... Um, Worked on that for about a year, and I, I was so burnt out after that that I it was all in black and white. And uh, I had been uh, my next on my docket was the next the next project I wanted to work on would, would be something in color, or something that would be fun, something that I would think that that I thought would take me not too long to do. You know, I could probably pump it out in about a month and then um, move on to the next thing. And uh, so I, I did the project. Um, and uh, I noticed these guys in in Philly um, riding in, you know, black guys riding with cowboy hats in Fairmont Avenue, you know, and so I wanted to know what, what that was all about. Uh, I'm originally from Oklahoma, so it wasn't that big a deal for me. I mean, my family is, is, is I have, you know, that in my heritage. My, my grandfather was a, was a cowboy. My um, family had ranches and horses, and I rode horses and everything, but Never really thought that it was anything unusual, but when I, when the story ran, um, got all sorts of mail. I mean, just probably more mail than any other story I'd ever worked on, and um, it it sort of spurred me to think, "Wow, this is really something new out here." I mean, I didn't know that people didn't know that there was such thing as black cowboys, and so. Um, well, let me just start the slideshow, and I'll and uh, I'll talk through it from there. So, can I share? Oh, I I can... Okay. Uh, yeah. You too. Bye bye. Okay. Let me share my screen here. All right. Okay. You can all see that. See my screen. Okay. Uh, so the name of the project is Black Cowboys in America. Um, I'm working on this uh, as a book that will come out next year, uh, next spring, if all goes well, uh, published by Judge George Thompson Publishing in uh, Virginia. Uh, and it'll be accompanied by a 50-piece uh, exhibition that will travel. Um, so we're working on all that now. Um, this was the uh, Sydney Magazine that uh, that uh, the story first appeared in. Um, it was uh, 1993. Yeah, <laughs> I get all these dates are starting to blend together. I've been looking at these pictures for 30 years, so I have no. I've lost all sort of objectivity. To these pictures, they're just like, I mean, they're just like my children. In fact, they're older than my children. So I. They've spent too, probably too much time with them, and I want to get this book done because I just this this idea this book has been on my back for the, like the last twenty five years, and I just want to get this thing done and move on. But uh, <laughs> and this is where the the mag it first appeared in the Inquirer Sunday Magazine. Um, and you know we're still trying to figure out how to do the. I don't want the pictures to be sequential in the book. I don't want them to be. Uh, broken up in, in any sort of narrative structure. Um, although I've sort of done that here just for the purposes of just sanity, because it just makes sense to do it this way, I think. Um, so I've broken them up in different groups in the city and on the ranch, and you'll see as I, as I go through. 
Um, but uh, so uh, it all started in the city. It all started with city cowboys. So um, uh, started with this guy's uh, stables. They were over in the Fairmont section. George Bullock, everybody called him Bumpsy, and, and his son uh, Jordan. Um, Jordan's thirty-five now. You'll see the next picture. You'll see what he looks like. Um, but uh, it all started with him. He had these these stables in over in, in uh, uh, the Fairmont section. They're condos now, but it was where the old Acme um, building used to be, where they kept all their trucks and everything. And uh, so, um, you know, just basically walked up, and knocked on the door, and said, "Hey, you know, do you mind if I just hang out in your stables for a while?" And he said, sure, you know, no problem. So I spent like a, probably about a month hanging out with him and just a really amazing group of people that uh, stable the horses there. And uh, um, as time went on, you know, I traveled with him. We went to New York. We did some trips together. It was, it was just really amazing thing. This is what Jordan looks like now. And this is him and his his daughter. Uh, he's a, um, uh, he held, uh, does he trains horses for the parks casino uh so i went up and spent some time with him i want to go back and spend more time his daughter uh rides she's really into horses now um very you know they're, they're just a horse family they're just a you know they're all they're all you know horse people um but you know flashing back to it this was in new york um this is, you know, in New York and Harlem, actually, they went to a parade in Harlem. I just thought this was just amazing. The, you know, this horse in, in downtown Harlem, um, you know, guys were doing rope tricks on the Fifth Avenue. It was just wild. It was really fun. Um, this is Bumpsy riding through the, the, um, the, uh, what now, what was, what were the stables? They were sort of behind the Acme building there. Um, the weirdest thing was that during COVID, I got this call from from a Bumpsy and just out of the blue, I hadn't spoken to him for like 20 years. And he said, uh, hey, Ron, this is Bumpsy. You know, I just wanted to get in touch with you and see how things are going. I'm like, oh, man, so great to hear from you. He goes, I, you know, I really want you to get in touch with, with Jordan because uh, he's been um, doing really well. I just want you to know how he's doing. Yeah, you know, let's get up the you volume. Know, he's got here. this really great daughter. Let's and let and you all. go here. And uh, and I said, sure, well, I'll get in touch with him. And uh, so a couple of weeks went by and I ended up calling Jordan, hey, thank you. texting him and uh, uh -huh. found out that Bumpsy died of COVID. And it was just so shocking that that was the last thing I said to him. I thought we would we would just sort of pick up where we left off. Um, but, you know, I sort of made a promise to Jordan that I would stay in touch with him and and uh, I've been up a couple of times to to make pictures at at uh, the Parks Casino, um, and actually it's kind of vi ventured over into video now. So what I'd like to do is maybe do either a documentary or a, a series of short documentaries that I can post maybe on Instagram on the people that I've since that I photographed, uh, and I'll show you some. There's some pictures coming up here that that I'll show you. Um, this was a guy there in the New York all dressed up in Western wear by one way sign, you know, it, 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 they were the, the, the irony of this whole thing just became so outrageous at some time, at some points that it was just, it was just funny. Um, this was in Strawberry Mansion. This guy's name is Bob Hill. And a lot of these people aren't around anymore. I mean, Bob passed away a few years ago. Um, the um, Malcolm X mural is not there anymore in Strawberry Mansion, but he was, this was one of the first, people that I followed, he was on his way to um, the park from the stables and he rode past this mural and I was driving in my car and jumping out every, you know, five feet and taking a picture and jumping back in the car. Uh, but I call this picture legends. Um, some kids that were um, to make extra money, they would wash the horses they would come by the stables and wash horses and they, they just washed his horse and they had him out to dry in the sun they picked up the little game of basketball as a horse dried um they would you know ride through town um waving to people you know people were coming out on the, on the streets like you know it's like what's going on you know all these guys and cowboys are riding down you know like south philly it was really wild 
Um, this is in North Philly. I call this co concrete uh, ca uh, canyon because it sort of reminded me of, you know, the some of the scenes you might see in a Western where the guys are riding through the, the canyons in Arizona or Utah or wherever. Um, and, uh, but this was in, uh, riding down in uh, the street in New York. Uh, at a picnic. Um, so that, those, those are just a few things. So I'll back up and say that if I showed you all the pictures that I made during this, this thing, and nobody would ever do that, but if I showed you even half of the pictures that I made during this project, I made, um, during COVID, I went back through and, um, and started to edit through all the, all my images. These were all shot on uh, 20, uh, they were all shot 35 millimeter uh, Ektachrome 200 for the most part. Um, and I had uh, 15,000 slides and I just, you know, started, you know, not, a lot of those are just my feet, you know, in the sky, <laughs> but there were some, there were some things in that I had just forgotten about. So I edited through, um, called a friend of mine who worked at National Geographic. Oh, the other part of that was that I shot after the Inquirer, after I shot this for the Inquirer, National Geographic, Geographic got in touch with me and said that they'd like for me to shoot a story for them. I spent about six months on the road for them shooting, um, and uh, uh, which ended up being on their website, not in the magazine for some reasons that were a little disappointing, but um, it, it, it wound up being in, the, in their, in their uh, website, but it stayed on the website for 10 years and they had just started their website. So it, it was featured on the, on the splash page of the website for almost 10 years. So it was, that was really satisfying. Um, but um, after editing through these images, we're down to about, we got down to about 5,000, then we got down to about 2,000. Now we're down to about 200 of the what is the what we think is the best although we're going back and forth with 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 that it so uh so this is some scenes from um from the rodeo part of the shoots and i shot rodeos all over the country this one was in i think in in uh illinois um and you know i don't want the images to be i don't want like i said i don't want the book to be sequential or um or narrative i really want them the pictures to to sort of showcase the black ex the experience of of, of cowboy life in in in, uh, in the black community. That's that's what I want. You know, I want them to be more poetic, more reflective, um, more um, not even. I'm not even. I don't even care if they're in focus. To be honest, I just want them to 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 evoke something more so than uh, describe something. And uh, the book that I'm actually trying to mimic was a book by Bill Allard, who was a photographer for Geographic. He did a book called Vanishing Greed uh, at least probably 30, 40 years ago. Just, but it was called, that book is just hung in my head forever. It's just one of the most exquisite books about uh, about any sort of genre I've ever seen. And I, first of all, I just love Bill Allard. I remember when I was working with Geographic, um, when I was doing the story for Geographic, I came in for an edit one day and um, my editor um, was looking through the images and I shot some pictures in the middle of the day. And, you know, she, she said, you know, Ron, just don't shoot any pictures in the middle of the day, only shoot golden hour, you know, shoot from six in the morning till 10, 10 in the morning. And then from four o'clock until dark, <laughs> just don't shoot anything. Though. She said, why don't you go down and talk to Bill Allard? He's really good about shooting pictures in, 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 uh, in the middle of the day. And so I go down to his office and knock on his door and I'm like, and I'm, I'm like, it's like, I'm talking to God, you know, <laughs> it's like I, I'm, I'm actually in Bill Allard's office and talking to him. And uh, I said, Mr. Allard, um, um, oh man, my mind went absolutely blank. My editor's name. Uh, anyway, it'll come to me. But I said, she sent me down here to ask you, talk to you about life. And he said, Oh, you know, don't worry about, don't worry about her. He said, all you have to do is just shoot, shoot, uh, um, uh, find the good light and the bad light. And that was it. And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? You know, so I walked out of his office and I'm like scratching my head. 
And it took me years to figure out what's that, what's going on with that. But, you know, but it's true. I mean, you know, there's good light everywhere. You just have to look for it. You have to look for the good light. And if it's not good, then you wait for it to be good or you wait for something to happen in that bad light and make it good. So that's what I tell my students, you know, when they come up to me and, you know, they're shooting in, in uh, tricky lighting situations. I'm like, well, you just, there's a, there is good light there somewhere. You just have to find it. And then you have to wait for something to happen in it. So that was the advice I got. And that's the advice I give. Um, again, at, you know, at the rodeo, um, the rodeo pictures are, for me, I mean, I, I really think rodeo pictures are kind of a dime a dozen because you, it's easy to make a, ro a rodeo picture. It's difficult to make a good rodeo picture. I mean, I shot so many rodeos that, um, and maybe it came home, come back with a handful. I probably have, you know, uh, 2000 slides of just rodeos. Um, but um, it's it's a matter of just trying to figure out like where to be, what's going to happen, um, you know, just waiting for things to happen in, the, in that good light sometimes. Uh, this is at a rodeo in Oklahoma um, during the grand entry. Um, this was the uh, uh, rodeo parade in Omoge, Oklahoma. Omoge, Oklahoma has the largest black, they, they claim to have the largest black sporting event in the country. And it is a huge rodeo. They just had it, I think probably last week. And I would have gone down there, but I would I don't didn't feel like scorching to death, but it it's amazing. I mean, 10,000 people a night come out for this rodeo. It's just really unbelievable. Spend a lot of time for, just thinking about, you know, families, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, you know, just trying to make those kind of connections with the, with how the rodeo sort of functions and who goes to rodeos and who participates in rodeos. And a lot of these guys, you know, they're family men. They have little kids. I would love to find this guy and his son. His son, this kid now has got to be at least 30. I would love to find him. And uh, I'm, I one of my students actually is his built a spreadsheet and she's been able to track down a lot of people so we've been uh, slowly sort of picking away at this and uh, 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 finding some people um, found these two guys they were good good friends but they were also competitors so they were they had sort of that competitive spirit but they also had you know that they were good friends so I just I just really sort of like that part of this um, this little guy it was in Dallas. If you measure his belt buckle, it's about the size of his head. <laughs> but he was such a he was such a feisty little guy. He was going to be a roper. I would also like to find him. His dad was a was a was a, a calf roper. Um, at the rodeo, you know, getting ready, getting bandaged up behind the scenes. I found that I it was more interesting. I thought shooting behind the scenes, and it was in the, in in in. Uh, shooting the actual action because there was so much stuff that go that went on and i don't have many of those pictures in this show but um it was there was so much stuff that went on you know the guys just being anxious or nervous or you know getting themselves pumped up to get on these you know two thousand pound animals and be hurled around for eight seconds it's pretty amazing um and trying to get away from them you know they were you know this guy was you know on his way to um he had done his done his eight seconds and he was off running because the bull was right behind him. Um, and when I say right behind him, I mean right behind him. This guy got his hand stuck and was being drug around by the um, by the bull. And. Uh, the rodeo clown came in and I, so I spent some time with this guy. I, I did a lot of, a lot of shots, or a lot of, uh, actually I shot this guy with film because for some reason I shot film. I can't remember why, but it's all film. And, uh, but he, he was amazing. I mean, he would just throw himself in the, these situations that were just crazy. And, you know, he pulled this guy off the, uh, off the bull and protected him. Um, it was just really unbelievable. I have a whole series of just him doing his thing as a rodeo clown. 
you know, it was also the sort of in rodeos, <clears throat> sort of the cowboy code that somebody's hurt, you don't immediately run, at least, I don't know if it's that way, this way now or not, but then somebody was hurt, you didn't, if you, I guess if they thought he could get up and walk away, they would just let him do that on his own rather than sort of embarrass him by running out and making sure he was okay. So yeah, I just thought it was really interesting. This guy sat on his knees for a while before and no, nobody was paying him any attention. He eventually just got up and dusted himself off and walked away. Um, found this woman. She was with a writing group in Oakland and she was a stenographer uh, working for, um, you know, a court stenographer. Uh, but on the weekends, she she barrel raced and she was fierce. I mean, she stood probably about five foot tall, but man, she was a fierce woman. It was just unbelievable how, you know, driven she was to do this. Um, and then this little sequence, I mean, this is like a throwaway sequence, but I, for some reason, I always liked it. I don't know if it'll, it'll get in the book or not, but there's just roping. This was in a, in a backyard rodeo arena. Um, these guys in, in Texas would have these rodeos literally in their backyard. They have a rodeo arena and uh, they'd have roping contests. Uh, so on the ranch. So um, we have um, uh, actually I was really pushing for this one to be on the cover of the book, but on, the only people that uh, liked it was myself and the designer and everybody else was pushed for another one that you'll see in a little bit, but I, I don't know. There was something about this one that, that I really liked. Um, but uh, Molly Stevenson. So I went down to uh, Houston, uh, photographed her wedding. And uh, it was a traditional Western style wedding. And actually this be this became a whole story in the in the paper. So also after the story ran in the, in the magazine, I, uh, talked my editors into let, letting me go out and uh, just find more stories across the country. And this is when the Enquirer had money and we could do anything, you know, kind of wanted. And so I went out and found all these stories out. I've, and somebody told me about Molly, who was getting married. She comes from a, from a very, uh, from a long heritage of cow people, rodeo or uh, horse people in just outside of Houston. Her family had a 640 acre ranch out there. And uh, so I went down, photographed the wedding. There's a ton of wedding pictures that I'm not gonna take, take you through. But um, uh, this was uh, during the wedding. This was her husband, uh, uh, Scott. <laughs> and this is what they look like now. I went down uh, last year and uh, photographed them um they're you know they're up in a, up in age they're they're um but all this stuff in the background they have this museum um that they're trying to get together um that will uh honor uh cowboys of color women um and uh you know everybody they, they want to have sort of this recognition of cowboys across all genres and and uh and uh what's after genres genres and genders i guess so um but yeah so and this is actually a screen grab because i went down and what i ended up doing was was doing more i did all video i didn't do any stills which was kind of surprising because i really wanted to do some stills but they had such interesting stories so i just shot a bunch of videos that i want to edit together and do do uh, some documentaries uh but they also raised these watusi cattle um, on their on their on their uh, ranch, and uh, it was such a scene. I I, I wanted to play the video of them walking out of the field because I went out with them to to feed the cattle one afternoon, and they just come from the way back into the ranch. They come walking out, and they look like these prehistoric creatures that come lumbering out with these ten foot horn spans. It was just amazing. I just didn't know if it would play on Zoom. I know I've I've had a problem playing video on Zoom, so I didn't want to um, get caught up in that. But they are truly amazing animals. Um, this woman came to came to Molly's wedding actually with her pet pig, <laughs> with uh, that had pink toenails, and uh, it was she was really the hit of the show. Everybody was you know walking up, petting the pig. She had a little bow in the pig's hair. 
Um, and then just, you know, pictures of ranch life. This was after a, you know, guy had spent the day working in the on the out in the ranch doing stuff and he was having a smoke and drinking a beer and sitting in the back of his pickup listening to tunes with the with the boombox in the back. Um so this was at probably the craziest this is probably the most the craziest thing that I did while I was there. So I spent all day shooting one of these backyard rodeos and this guy had a dance hall in his yard and you know when i say yard you know it's like we're thinking like yards i mean these are like his yard was like 10 acres you know so he had this dance hall in the back of his yard and it was down over near um the east east texas now around brownsville and they had the most jamming zydeco music that i've ever heard playing in the background and this guy had to have been 150 years old and he was out there doing splits and jumping up and down. And it was crazy. It was crazy. And I was shooting. I shot and shot and shot. I shot so much that my camera shut down. It was so hot in there. It was it was crazy hot. I mean, it must have been like, not, it felt like it was probably like 90 degrees inside there. And this is like at two o'clock in the morning. And this guy is still going on. And I'm like, okay, I am, my camera stopped. I'm going home. And the, but the party kept, kept on going. um just big skies in texas uh actually this is out in near um on the main line actually um a man had a ranch out there that he leased and raised horses and this was his grandson um and he was you know just pulling this horse along um this is in goliad texas where they were doing um they were uh, brand. They, it was branding day, so they're branding. They were they were um, you know um, neutering the the animals and doing things like that. So I spent the whole day with them, you know, as they as they did that went through that process. So branding, you know, they put the cows in a chute and um, put the brand on them. Um, this is a Sunday morning, sort of a leisurely ride through the ranch. You know, there's. there's sunflower field that that they uh that they were riding through and uh, so i was riding along with them um this is out in oakland texas oak oakland uh, california and uh so this guy his name was cash and he had, i don't know if he invented this or he just came up with it or what but it was a garden tiller that he had strapped to a pole and the the tip the thing he would turn it on and would just go around in a circle it was held by the rope that was attached to it. So it would just, you know, go around in the circle and he would practice roping with it. So the back legs would kick and he would throw the rope at it. So it's just, just the wildest thing. He was just out there doing this all day, you know, or all afternoon practicing his roping. <clears throat> this is back in Philadelphia or outside of Philly and um, where's that near, uh, near Palo, someplace out that way. This is not there anymore either. It's all, condos again all housing um one of the things i wanted to do is i wanted to find sort of the quintessential annie locally pack i wanted to find the woman that would sort of exemplify what it was to be a, a, a cow person and everybody said oh you got to find Be uh, betsy uh, bromwell um and she lived out near stillwater oklahoma um and so i went paid her a visit knocked on her door and she she came in this is betsy uh, she was sitting there, I think she was drinking some Jack Daniels, smoking a Marlboro after a day's work. Um, this woman was probably the, the toughest person I've ever met. She was amazing. She was absolutely amazing. Unfortunately, she passed away not too long ago, but um, she was just, she was fearless. Um, she was also sort of a, a horse whisperer. I mean, she would walk up these horses that couldn't be ridden and you know, make them do pirouettes, you know, I mean, she was just unbelievable. Um, just hanging out with her was, was really fun. She also had this vision of being a professional golfer. So she would get up in the morning and whack about 10 golf balls out in the prairie before going to work. Or with her horses. You know, she worked in, uh, 
she was truly uh she did all the things that you would think that you know horse people do i mean she did she did shoeing she you know um you know veterinarian duties all kinds of things um this is her during a at, at the end of the day one day um somebody brought this horse to her and uh, there's a whole series of pictures with this but this horse was not had never been ridden it was it was, it was unbroken and they brought it to her to break the horse and um she took the horse out of the, the trailer and tied it up to um, a post and punched it. <laughs> I was like, whoa, you just punched a horse. <laughs> and the horse was little days. And then she let, she turned the horse loose and the thing went crazy. I mean, it was like, it was like, a, it was just insane. And she put one, she grabbed the thing and she got one foot in the stirrup and rode it around like this for, it seemed to me like hours. I'm running out and out there with a 24 millimeter lens trying to take pictures, you know, and try, and also trying not to get trampled. Um, but um, she finally got it, she finally got it calmed down by the end of the day. I mean, of course, it's like a little kitten. I mean, she was petting it off the head. She was riding it around. It was completely, you know, under control and broken. Also wanted to find somebody like, uh, you know, the, the sort of the quintessential cowboy, you know, somebody that really lived their lives as a, as a, as a, as a, as a cowboy uh, male. Um, and I uh, found uh, David Cormier. He was lived down in Southeast Texas. Um, and uh, he had been around horses his whole life. Um, that's all he's ever done. All he ever wanted to do. Um, he, uh, lived on uh, I think 40 acres that his uncle had given him and uh, they had put a trailer out there where, where he where he where he lived and so I went down uh, to spend a week with him and um, you know I, I would uh, you know go with him he worked in a cell barn he worked shoeing horses and doing all that and uh, one morning I heard all this racket going on outside and uh, this is him putting his boots on and uh, it he was out catching his horse to ride to work and his horse was sort of a half broken um i don't know quarter horse i guess um that somebody had given him because they couldn't ride it and he would go out and he would catch this thing you know pull it in put the saddle on it and go to work and this is the way this is the way he went to work every day So like I said, he worked in cell barns. He worked in, you know, did all kinds of stuff. This, this was a, a pig lot that he was uh, trying to, they were getting ready to sell. And, uh, you know, everybody in town really looked up to him. I mean, little kids, the, all the adults there, everybody looked up to him. He was he was kind of a bigger than, larger than life guy. He was only 21. He was, he had done a lot in his life, but uh, he just had the respect of everybody. This is him down in the pit at the cell barn. And it was hot, dusty work. You know, one of the things I never I never quite understood is like, why don't you guys just roll up your sleeves? I mean, they all had their sleeves buttoned down the whole day. And it's like 100 degrees outside with jeans and their shirts tucked in. I mean, I'm running around in there with shorts and sneakers. I'm like, I am too hot. I can't deal with this. But this is the way you work. So I was down and he had this limp when I, when I was down there. And uh, so I went to the doctor with him. They did a, they did an MRI on his leg. Turned out that he, they found cancer in his knee. And uh, which, you know, really bummed him out as it would anybody. And uh, so I went back after, um, not because of this, but I'd spent a week with him. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, about a week later, I got a call from his mom and said, well, you know, they're going to have to amputate David's leg. Looks like he's, he's going to have to, it's going to have to go off because the cancer is really bad. And then another couple of weeks went by and I got a message in saying that he had passed away. I mean, the cancer was super aggressive. I mean, it went through his body like lightning. And um, so I never got a chance to go back down and spend more time with him. They have a rodeo down there in his name now. But um, it was really sad because he was such a great, 
person. He was so young and he was so talented. And uh, it just breaks my heart that he he just he just didn't get a chance to live life. Um, this is one of the pictures I made of him. I, I call this David's last ride because, and I gave this to the family because it was um, very fitting of, of David, you know, when he was, you know, doing his job that a rainbow popped out. So um, these are just a few images of some portraits that I made. And again, there's so many of them. I just pulled out, I just pulled out of the bag some things that were available. Um, call this Warren Felt hat. Uh, this is a young guy that was on a trail ride um, that um, I spent some time with in uh, South Texas. Uh, just like this guy's 10 gallon hat. Uh, I found these guys, these these um, retired cowboys at uh, in South Southeast Texas at the O'Connor Ranch, and uh, they had uh, it was one of these ranches that was you know bigger than Rhode Island. I mean, it was this huge ranch down there, and they um, the owners had uh, given them um, their own bunks, their own bunk houses, just for them to live their lives out. This guy's name is Nathan uh, Youngblood. So I did some oral histories with them and the stories they told were just amazing. I'm, I'm going to put those in the book, probably um, abbreviated versions of the oral histories, uh, but just really just unbelievable things that, 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 that they said, you know, what it was like for them. They had never been out of Texas before. Uh, and Nathan's story was that he had, they put, they uh, drafted him during World War II and put him out uh, and, uh, on target practice and he was able to pick off everything they threw at him and he said well you know it's you know that's what i did you know i just shot things on the ranch if they were bothering the cattle you know so they put him and they and, they, and he became a gunner and uh, he went out and uh you know on a on a on a ship and was a gunner during world war ii and then when he got out of the service he came back to the ranch and that's that's where he spent the rest of his life um, this man, um, his name was Kit. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to blank out on the next two names, but, um, he had some really amazing stories as well as, 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 as well as, uh, this man. Um, this was at a, uh, rodeo and, uh, in, uh, at AJ Walker's ranch, uh, who had one of these, you know, Arena, rodeo arenas in the back and this is aj uh, aj just passed away last year I, I went when i went down uh when i went to houston last year i really wanted to look him up and i i talked to some people that that knew him and said well he just he literally just passed away a few months ago this was at a cookout so again, you know, it's just looking for that good light and the bad light situation. This little girl um, was the daughter of Mike um, Ladding, Michael Ladding. His father had a traveling rodeo uh, uh, outfit that would go all around, uh, sort of based in South Chicago, but he would, he would go to Illinois and uh, surrounding states with his traveling rodeo. And uh, she was she was a little cowgirl, you know, all the way. And so I called Mike a couple of weeks ago and introduced myself. I said, Mike, you know, I don't know if you remember me, but I, but I followed you guys around for about two weeks. And he said, oh, yeah, I remember. And I said, so how's your daughter? Is she? Um, I said, I would love to come back out and photograph and just catch up with you guys. He says, ah, she won't have anything to do with horses now. <laughs> he said, I just I think I just scared all the horse life out of her. So. <laughs> So that that was kind of a bummer because I, I just figured she would be like a barrel racer or something, you know. But she doesn't. He said she doesn't have anything to do with horses. Um, just love this guy's face. This is at a rodeo in Texas, and I asked him. To, the light was really nice, and I just said, "Hey, can I just can you just sit down and just let me take your picture?" I just, you have a beautiful face, you know. I don't know what he thought about me, but I said, you know. But he did. He posed for me, and that that is the picture I got. Um. And this guy, I'm not sure that I was never sure if he, I was never sure if he knew 
I couldn't figure out how, what he thought about me because I think he thought that, first of all, I was like this city slicker guy coming down from Cal Philadelphia to make images. But um, he never smiled at me. But uh, I took a lot of pictures of him scowling at me because, and he was perfectly happy to let me do that. So I did it. Um, this little boy, this is a rodeo in Texas. And this is me 30 years ago. <laughs> I do know how to rope. I do know how to uh, do a, well, I used to. I wouldn't try it now. First of all, I told you I have bad knees. I wouldn't be able to do this. But I we used to do this when I was growing up, you know. So um, this was me, uh, you know, tying up a cattle after roping it. So, and da da, that's the end. So, and I won't even get into this photo because this this was a whole other situation. Well, I will real quick. So, when I was shooting for Geographic, I this I was traveling this with this uh, with this uh, uh, trail ride, and uh, they were it was sort of tradition that people would um, go come from all different parts of Texas to the Fort Worth um, uh, rodeo. It was like a big deal, and so I called it. I called up Geographic and said I need a helicopter. And said, well, just find some place and get one. So there was no. I was out in the middle of no place down the hill country near Austin. I said I need. I didn't know where I could find one. So I looked in the year, in the uh, yearbook. I looked in the uh, phone book and uh, there was a guy that actually had a helicopter service. And so he said, well, yeah, just meet me. Tell me where to meet him, meet him in this field. Um, and uh, and uh, we'll, we'll go up. And so I go to this field where he told me to go. There was, it, there was nothing there. There was, it was just a field. And I look down, there's this guy coming up the, up the road with, in a pickup with his helicopter in the back of his pickup and i said okay <laughs> how's this going to work out <laughs> and so it was one of these ultralight helicopters and so he's you know hop in you know i get in the thing and we're shoulder to shoulder you know the blades about a foot over my head it's whirling around he takes off from his pickup and i see these guys going down and i'm thinking i am going to fall out of the sky that was the only thing i had in my mind we're going to fall <laughs> and he found the, you know, I found the guys where, where they, you know, they were, in, they were coming down the road. And, but where I, the, where I needed the helicopter to be was re really close to some highline wires. And I said, well, you know, and we're yelling at each other. And, you know, we used to shoot aerials all the time when I worked for the Inquirer. And I know that there's restrictions and whatnot. And I'm yelling at the guy, I said, well, I really need to be over there by the Highline wires. He goes, no problem. And so he takes the helicopter and literally sets it down in, in, a, in a triangle of Highline wires. And I'm looking over and I see the blades, you know, whirling past these wires. And I'm thinking, okay, this is where I meet my maker. And, but I, you know, made, I just put, hit the motor drive, made this picture, got up. He took me back to the, to the pickup, landed in the pickup. And I gave him five bucks for the ride or whatever it was and ran away. <laughs> but anyway, that was my uh, my big, uh, you know, geographic helicopter. Everybody should have a geographic helicopter story. So that was it. This is what the book's going to look like. Um, uh, this is the, you know, the, the, what's been selected for the cover. Like I said, it's going to come out in uh, 2024 spring. Um, we're still working on uh, sequencing images, and I think in September we'll get around to uh, sequencing everything and hopefully uh, send it to the publisher sometime in the winter uh, so it'll be published. So um, that's it. So if you want a book, let me know. Um, the Print Center has been really gracious to um, offer um, their, uh, so they're going to serve as a fiscal conduit. So we're also raising money for the book. So um, um, if you want to buy the book or if you want to donate to the book or whatever, um, you can go through the print center um, for um, for that. So that's it. Thanks so much for inviting me. And uh, I will stop sharing. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, Eileen, we can't hear you. 
uh, oh, uh, now you can. Okay, Ron, thank you. Um, yes, and I want that book for my library. Okay. So thank you. Um, yes, and and are you going to take some questions now? Yeah. And again, thank you. Th and and I'm sorry about the the problem with um with signing in and things. I I will look into the problem and make sure that um it it doesn't happen again. So I'm going to work on it. So thank you. Thank you. Ron, I, I have a question. Sure. Our um, uh, I mean, fabulous uh, project and you know so, so beautifully photographed. But are, are uh, cowboys of color accepted in? Um, I guess you call it the the white rodeo world. Mm -hmm. There was a time when when they weren't. Um, there was a guy named Lou Vasson that started up the Bill Pickett Rodeo Circuit, um, actually around the time that I started this project. And I wanted to photograph that circuit, and he was so protective of it. I think he thought that I was going to steal it or, or make money off of it. I mean, you know, there there is no way I'm going to make any money on this. I mean, if I, I mean, I sell a print every once in a while, you know, whatever. But I, I figured we were, I was talking with a friend of mine. I, I think we're making about maybe about a penny a month, maybe if we're lucky. So there was no way we we're going to make any money off of this. But um, he, he started the, the Bill Pickett Rodeo Circuit and really opened it up for black cowboys. I mean, now it is open. You know, now I mean, I think the first uh, at the National Finals Rodeo, uh, maybe. It's probably like 10 or 15 years ago, they had their first black uh, champion, which is a really big deal. So, yeah, so now it's it's open, you know. I mean, there's, you know, there's always going to be something out there, but um, but it is, it is, it is a lot more open than it used to be. I'm sure your pictures had a lot to do with that one. Well, I'd like to think so. I, I can't really claim that, but, you know. Hey, Ron. Uh, this is Mike Brown. How are you? Good. I, I just wanted to compliment you, uh, not only on the artistry of the work that you showed us, but the persistence and the hard work, I'm sure, that went into doing that for decades. A few years ago, before she passed away, I had the opportunity to work with uh, Mary Ellen Mark. Oh, yeah down in the Oaxaca area. And believe it or not, we photographed Mexican cowboys uh, around the Oaxaca area. Uh, you know, she did, like you, decades long projects and her motto was always go back. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering yep. if you could kind of share with us your thoughts on how, how do you sustain something like this? Not, not just financially, but also emotionally over time. Mm -hmm. well i mean you know to be honest i mean there are a lot of projects in between this project so it's not as if i've only been working on this project in fact i'm working on another project now that is taking up took up a lot of the time that i thought i would be working on this project this summer i mean i went on sabbatical from school last year and i thought i was just going to dedicate that year to finishing this project finishing the book going back i started off strong i went down to houston did a bunch of interviews did a bunch of video um and then i'm now i'm involved in this other thing. This, the furthest thing from photography i mean i'm i'm building a greenhouse <laughs> that has portraits of gun violence victims so we're, we're building a monument to gun violence victims in, in elkins park but that's a whole other thing um but yeah you know it's to be absolutely honest i had kind of almost forgotten about this project you know i mean the pictures were in the i have a big tupperware thing back there where all the photos were in they were all you know the little yellow boxes covid hit you know school shut down so that became my project and if I can't say if it weren't for COVID, I wouldn't have done this, but that was a big impetus to do it, you know, because I had I had time all of a sudden. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think that it's just one, I've always had a project. I don't know what it's like to not have a project. Um, and so it, it, it just sort of 
becomes, you know, it just sort of becomes a project, even after, even, even if after it was dormant for a while, it just became another project. Um, so, you know, I think what was really sad was after being detached from it for so long and then going back to it and then finding out that a large portion of the folks that I photographed aren't around anymore. That was really hard, you know, to hear Bumsy, you know, call up and tell me to see his son. And then he passes away a couple of weeks later, things like that. Um, not being able to see AJ, I was really looking forward to seeing AJ, you know, uh, and then he passed a couple months before I got down to Houston. So that's, that was difficult, um, you know, but um, I don't know. I mean, I've just always been project driven and it's just, there's, it's just always been something that I've done and I, I don't know how not to do it. So. All right. Well, thanks for sharing that. Sure. Yes, I have a question uh, for you, Ron. Uh, my name is Mike. Hi there. Hi. Uh, what a fabulous, uh, you know, set of pictures. So, some of them just, I, I have to go back and see them again. Um, There's a know. book out there for you. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. Yeah. So, you know, so uh, the, the picture of your, oh, by, by the way, I mean, the photography was great, uh, but your narrative also, I thought, added so much to the telling of that story, you know, and uh, the words just flowed really nicely. So, you know, good job on that. Thanks. Uh, the, the picture you did, um, I think it was of a, of a basketball court. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there was so much going on in that picture. Can you like talk about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, well, it wasn't a court actually. Actually it was, um, you know, I'll, I'll put it back up on the screen. Uh, it was um, some kids and they had, um, they had, uh, there it is. Let me see, Let me share my screen here. They had, this is where they made money. You know, they, it was like mowing a lawn, you know, like, you know, when you're a kid, you got and you mowed the lawn. So they would, they would um, wash, they would do things around the stables. You know, they would muck the stables. They would clean the stables. They would you know, do whatever they, whatever they, whatever the guys told them in the stables to do, you know, so that they had washed this horse and it was out drying, but, um, and then they just picked up a b basketball game. This is on an old, sort of an abandoned loading dock, um, is where it was. And they put up, you know, there was a, 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 put up a basketball goal out there, but it was just one of these things that, you know, it's like, it's funny, the more you shoot, the long, the longer you hang around, you get one or two good pictures. Um, and I don't know if you remember, there was a photographer at the Inquirer named Jerry Ladrigas. He photographed uh, sports. And he was probably one of the best sports photographers I've ever known. I mean, you you know, if you remember the Inquirer back in the heyday, I mean, he had some amazing, he and Ron Cortez had some amazing, amazing sports pictures. He estimated that he had made over the course of his life shooting sports at least 3 million pictures. And he said, maybe I have a hundred that are good. And he said, out of that hundred, I would have 10 that I would really talk about. <laughs> so, you know, if you hang around long enough, I think things just sort of happen, things sort of come, come together. And that's just, just one of those things where everything just sort of came together. And I just had to be there to take a picture of it. You know, the, the most tricky thing about this was the, shadow, the way the shadows worked. And I made a bunch of photos of, you know, because the kids, are they're not paying attention to me. They're just playing their game. And so I'm trying to just time myself for that photo, you know. And, uh, you know, the, you, you go back to the decisive moment idea, you know, that just waiting for that decisive moment to happen. And out of all the photographs, there's this one and there's maybe one other that I've shown um, that, so sort of had that 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 just that peak moment where everything sort of came together. Um, actually, this photo has been uh, out of the portfolio that when I, when I have exhibits and things like that, this photograph sell. In fact, it's probably out of print at this point. So I don't I don't huh. have any more any more of these these available. Uh, I may resize it and put it out as a different edition or something. We were kind of talking about that when the book comes out. So we'll see what happens. 
Okay, well, thank you for that. Sure. Hey, Ron. Yeah. This is Dutch. I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, you mentioned about the cowboy place that was somewhere near an acne. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it brought up, I don't know where that is. Mm -hmm. As a child of seven years and younger, I lived at 23rd and Diamond, okay. which is far from the, uh, the park. And I do remember going out, my father taking me there to ride on those horses. And so do you know of uh, any other place that's either in Fairmount Park or um, is that mm -hmm. the only one that's still around? This is close to that. This is up right up, uh, I can't think of the name of the street, but um, it's over where, how, what's a good place to tell you it's in brewery town but it's sort of the northern end of brewery town okay. um so there, there was an acne building there if you go over there now it's it's really just high-end condos i went over there the mural arts actually wanted to do um a mural and i suggested this photo over there and there was a wall that was perfect it was oblong it was long and narrow that i think this photograph would have fit in really well it, it hasn't happened yet but uh, I went over there to sort of scope out the area and uh, it's, it, I didn't even recognize it, but there's another stable called Fletcher street. that's up around 23rd and diamond up in that area. And so when the white house stables got torn down and redeveloped, most of the people from uh, that, those stables went to Fletcher street. And it, there was a movie that came out a few years, a couple of years ago called uh what was it called? Concrete Cowboy? Or, oh, yes. yes. It? Yeah, it had Idris Elbert, excuse me, in it. And it was a story about, you know, the Fletcher Street Cowboys. Um, so Jordan hated that movie. He said that it was not accurate. At, well, it's Hollywood, so it's never accurate. But he said it really, he felt it was really de degrading to the folks that had horses. He said, you know, it made them look dumb. It made them look really poor. He said, you know, you can't have a horse and be poor <laughs> it's it's expensive to have a horse and he said most of the folks that had horses were they treated their animals you know humanely they um took good care of them you know took them to the vet all that so um but yeah so that was and i think flusher street is still there it's that those stables are still thriving pretty much interest well, it was a great presentation and it brought back a lot of memories my dad was in the cavalry and during the war and he had a whole lot of stories and rode those horses out there in, I guess, Fairmont Park somewhere. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very yeah. much for presenting this. I really yeah. enjoyed it. Thanks. Um, well, I need. Did you? To say this, uh, did, did you uh, I, I guess obviously you started the project with film. Did you transition to digital, or did you keep it uh, all film? Well, actually, no, this was all, actually, I, I didn't start it with film. So when I started it with the, uh, with, with slides, they were all transparencies. They were all, it was all Kodachrome because mm -hmm. when we shot for the, for the magazine, we, it was all, it was all um, Kodachrome. Yeah. And then when um, I transitioned over to, uh, or started shooting for geographic, then it was all Kodachrome again, you know, and it was just like, lots of Kodachrome. I mean, it was amazing how much I, I, when I got done with the project, I think I had at least a hundred rolls of Kodachrome left over. And then, and then they stopped making Kodachrome, you know? So <laughs> I would, I take Kodachrome in it and show it to my students now, and they have no idea what, they don't know what a transparency is. So I show them, this is a slide. This is where it comes from. <laughs> you know, it's born out of this little yellow box. And it becomes this little thing that's beautiful and gorgeous and will never be reproduced again. So um, it's yeah. I, I mean, I really do miss those days. I remember when when we uh, when we start, when we transitioned over to digital, there were a few photographers that sort of had the attitude, you know, I'm going to stay with film until you pry it out of my cold dead hand kind of thing. <laughs> and you know, yeah, it was it was tough. It was really tough leaving film. I still shoot film. 
can still shoot. I love film. I did a project last year. That it was it was all four by five, black and white. Sounds. So so Ron, tell uh, what 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 was your go to uh, equipment on the road? I learned to travel light because. Uh, well, basically, I had what, what was my? I, I'm a Nikon guy, so I had all Nikons. So I, I had, uh, uh, I think I had a, so it was probably like a Nikon F4 back then, maybe something like that. I can't remember what model it was, but it was maybe an F4. And then I had, you know, the 20, 70 to 200 zoom, and then the, and then the, uh, the other thing was I didn't like zooms, you know, because you know there was that point there where zooms were just garbage you know but then Nar nikon started making better quality zooms i used to travel with all prime lenses which was a real pain i tell you like a 300 prime running around with that and you know a, a 24 and a you know 180 prime. <laughs> that was not fun but when they zoom started getting better I, I, I transitioned over to zooms it made life a lot easier and, you know a couple of flashes that's really all you need you know you don't really need a, a lot of stuff I, it wasn't like i was going to get any studio lighting out there you know, if you, and if you, you know, if you play your cards right, you know, and you balance your light with a good flash, you can get away with that. So, yeah. And a tripod, of course, you know, so. Um, we need to share a date. We need to be ready for September 19th and astrophotography. And actually, it's it's really a very current topic based on um, everything that's been been going on in the sky in the last week. So it's uh, it it should be really 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 good and exciting. And who's the other, be, thing, who's the person usually? Um, yes, it's 